there we go. All right, everything is going. Now, first of all, let's do a poll and see who's here. There we go. All right, if y'all can see the poll, I see some people who are responding to it. Are you a CARES? Are you an ally? Are you curious about this topic? Are you a counselor or a clinician? Or are you someone else? And I want, we, we have 41 people on here. That includes the hosts. So that means we can get up to the number of 38. We got 33. We need a few more people to sign in. It'd be great to have 100%. Right. I will make sure I'm going to take a picture of that so we'll have a record of it. And I'm going to end the poll. Can you all see that? All right, might require you to share it. Is it showing you share on your screen? I can see it. You say you okay. think it will require me to share well, results. Is it showing the results? Oh, here it goes. Yes. There we go. So it looks like it might have gotten launched again. Can y'all see? Did y'all see the poll? Yes. All right. All right. Good. All right. So I will put an end to that. Thank you all so much. It's really good to have everybody here. All right. Uh, so now I will introduce Riley Kirkpatrick, who needs no introduction. <laughs> Today's print uh, presenter, Riley Kirkpatrick is a person in long-term recovery, a CPSAD and CARES alumni from cohort 27. It says this is the best of all the CARES, but 28 is actually the best. It came right, you were very, you're very adjacent to the best CARES, Riley. <laughs> Riley is the executive director of Access Point of Georgia. It's one of Georgia's few harm reduction programs statewide, and it grew out of the need for services as the opioid epidemic and fentanyl overdoses have skyrocketed in recent years. Riley, so glad to have you here. Uh, thanks, Al. I'm grateful to be here, as always. Got a lot of love for my cares family uh, yeah so for those who don't know me um i'm riley kirkpatrick i'm a person in long-term recovery um i know that i know a lot of you from a lot of the cares academies over the last however many years um uh, but again i'm i'm wicked grateful for uh i'm gonna get cheesy here y'all but <clears throat> the life that not only recovery has given me, but that the Georgia Council has given me and becoming like just real talk, I became a CARES because it was a hoop that I had to jump through for the job that I had at the time, having no idea how much I would love being a peer, specifically a peer and um, like, I've been able to create, like carve out a pathway of work and serving uh, in my field, specifically people who use drugs, uh, had no idea that the doors that would open and how just how big life and recovery would get. Um, I've got deep, deep gratitude and love for, for this crew. Um, yeah, so we're going to talk about harm reduction, uh, fentanyl, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, and xylazine, which has been a problem in other areas. And we, uh, we are seeing like it is here, it is deeply affecting our communities, and we're going to talk about it. So am I good to just dive right in? I'm going to know. Yeah, go yeah, for it, Riley. We're good. Cut me off if you need. All right. Okay. And then do we have, let's see. Okay. Not at the beginning here. There we go. Okay. Everyone can see my screen, I'm assuming. We can. There you go. And okay. now we only see the presentation. That's good. Excellent. I have you guys on the side. 
I do not have the chat. Uh, we will have, we will pause for questions about the content therein. At first, we're just gonna talk about harm reduction, then we'll dive into fentanyl and then xylazine. Uh, we'll have some, some poll questions in there also. Okay, and then um, Al or Tara, if anything's happening, I'll uh, lean in 20 y'all to stop me if need be. Okay. be good. And I'll keep an eye out on the chat for you. Excellent. Yeah, I'm really here to support you, okay? Yeah, and somebody else keep letting people into the room because that's that's like not good for my ADD. <laughs> okay, I'm okay. watching it. Okay, so I feel like... Hold on, this is not that for me. This isn't letting me change. There we go. Okay. Uh, yeah, I already said a little about myself. Um, man, there's so much I could say here. Um, I will talk about harm reduction through the lenses of access point. Um, and just the fact that y'all, I started slinging syringes out of the back of my car with friends um, from one of my jobs. Just, I, I just like the people who couldn't get out of active use really were tugging on my heartstrings and they're not served by other agencies. Um, often it seems like people have to like get into recovery before they can be served. Um, and I've always just thought that's kind of weird. So what does access point do? I keep talking about being the ED there. Um, y'all can see this and I'm just going to kind of go through it. So some of the resources that access point offers, uh, SSP syringe service program, that is language that we use instead of needle exchange as needle exchanges is, is, uh, pretty stigmatized, but uh, you know, I will say needle exchange when people have no idea what I'm talking about. Uh, we do a lot of referrals and warm handoffs for treatment services, um, peer supports, peer check-ins with all of us. Um, we also have CPS, MH, like mental health peers, um, who are on this also, which thanks y'all for being here. Um, advocacy and education, uh, medication-assisted treatment, which is medications, usually agonist medications like uh, Suboxone, Methadone, Buprenorphine, medications, that kind of stuff. Harm reduction, criminal justice. Um, we'll really support folks and show up for them, whatever it is that they need. Safer use supplies and education, um, essentially helping folks do as little harm as possible while they're in active use. Narcan, naloxone education and distribution. <clears throat> we also distribute fentanyl, xylazine, and benzodiazepine test strips. Essentially, folks <clears throat> can test their substances in order to know if those substances are in them as well. <clears throat> we also do HIV and hep C testing and wound care for injection drug users. We have a part-time nurse on staff who, who does that. Essentially, Access Point holds a safe, non-judgmental space for people who use drugs in our area. We offer everything from safer use supplies to peer support, education, advocacy, and recovery resources. We network and collaborate with most other substance use and mental health programs in the greater athens Clark County area. We offer recovery supports in many different forms, everything from abstinence-based recovery programs, medication-assisted treatment, faith-based, to simply listening to someone who may be struggling and contemplating wanting to change their substance use patterns. We adamantly support multiple pathways to recovery. That is really big. We absolutely, we do not try to pour people into any particular mold and we don't force people into any pathway. Um, and really like we let them lead, we let them, lead what direction they want to go in and support them. Okay, so here's a little poll question. Al, if you can help me out here. I just want to know how familiar y'all are with um, harm reduction. So the first one is I'm a huge fan of harm reduction framework. I think it's an excellent model that should be practiced widely. The other is I've heard a bit about harm reduction framework, but I don't know enough to have an opinion yet. Then what is harm reduction? I know nothing about it. 
or harm reduction is a sham, it's dangerous, it does nothing except enable people to keep using. All right, we have the poll running. Everybody, please respond. We have some fans here today, Riley. That's good. Excellent. Some fans of harm reduction. All right, we're up to 32, 35. Look at us going. 36. Give it another th uh, two or three seconds. Anybody else want to respond? All right, Tara, is it giving you the option to share the poll? Um, no, but I see it and it gives me the option to end it. Let's not end it. Let's see, can y'all see it? Maybe it will, I think when the question, anyway, see. all right, anyway, so I will tell you what it says is 30 out of the 37 people who answered are uh, fans, huge fans of harm reduction. Six of the 37 have heard a little bit about harm reduction. And there's one person who says, what is harm reduction? And thank you okay. for being honest about that. Absolutely. And that helps a ton. And, you know, I'll be straight. There's a lot of haters of harm reduction, which, which I know, like, I used to be a lot more apt to fight. And that was a lot because I didn't have the skills and the tools yet. Um, but like when people aren't fans, nine times out of 10, it's because they don't understand what it really is and what we really do they'll they'll just hear something like what you give you give drug addicts clean syringes to use that's enabling that's insane <clears throat> and i have my fair share of haters undoubtedly i get hate mail that i i almost want to like print as like the best of craigslist but like the best of harm reduction hate mail <laughs> I think it's funny, but how can I get this poll off of here? If I move this, will it screw Does that do it? Is it gone? It's, yeah, it looks like it. I'll let one of y'all do that. All right, sorry about that. Oh, no why worries. It's not going away. I know it keeps popping back up. Okay. Well, thanks for jumping in that. And some of you may have been in either other harm reduction presentations I've done, or uh, I mean, it, it's becoming, it's a thing elsewhere. That's one reason that I did dive into this is it's just the South, specifically Georgia. Okay, so what is harm reduction? Um, it's a set of practices and principles surrounding drug use and often sex work put in place in order to reduce the amount of harm done to the people and their surrounding communities. I'm gonna like spit this really fast. They're often, harm is looked at in harm reduction often on a personal level, the harm that's created from the substance use or sex work or whatever it is. And then the harm that's to the community and then the greater social cultural harm. Um, and often a lot of that is related to the drug war. Uh, I know a while ago, it was during the pandemic, we had one and we talked about racialized drug policies and that kind of stuff. There's a lot of harm that's created by prohibition and um, just kind of coming at this from different ways. And harm reduction is about it. it we just accept that drug use is there and try to minimize its harms. So going down, it is a person first approach and often looks like radical acceptance, compassion and love and support no matter what up to the upper right. Harm reduction is also a movement for social justice. That's what I was just saying, the harms that are created on a social cultural level that are built on a belief in and respect for the rights and dignity of people who use drugs. Often in the recovery community, we, we have a lot of disdain for folks who have not engaged in abstinence-based recovery yet. And as harm reductionists, we don't do that. Uh, harm reduction incorporates a spectrum of strategies from safer use, managed use, to total and complete abstinence to meet drug users where they're at. 
we see that a lot. We meet people where they're at um, and addresses conditions of use along with the use itself, right? So we don't talk about just the substance use, we talk about the why behind it quite a bit. Oh, fun, we got a video. Okay. Red people don't recover. My name is Riley, and today I'm here to talk to you about a very controversial topic. So I hope you're in the mood to be challenged. Today, I wanna to talk about something called harm reduction. What is harm reduction? Harm reduction is an umbrella term that covers a range of practices and principles offered to people struggling with active addiction. Those programs include, but are not limited to, syringe service programs, medication assisted treatment, and education about safer use practices. These are community programs that provide sterile syringes to active IV drug users and serve as an access point for referrals to treatment services. Oftentimes, when the topic of harm reduction Riley, the audio has stopped. Use. This is just substituting one drug for another. I don't want someone in my community running a needle exchange or dispensing methadone or suboxone. This is understandable. In a perfect world, our communities are safer and more stable and fewer people are using drugs. But we need to acknowledge a difficult truth. Simply ignoring or condemning drug use does nothing to offset or fix the very real damage that drugs have on our communities. So we need to have tough conversations about realistic ways to reduce the negative effects of drugs on people in our community and help drug users find their pathway into recovery. As someone myself who has fallen into substance use disorders and found my way into recovery, here are some insights I would like to share with you. Harm reduction programs do not encourage or enable drug use. What these programs do is keep people alive and provide a beacon of hope and support for people who are struggling with addiction. I can tell you firsthand that one of the greatest challenges a person faces when seeking to recover is a sense of isolation. A fear of punishment or judgment keeps people addicted and alone. These people exist in the dark. They struggle alone, and as they struggle, they use drugs more and more often and in increasingly dangerous ways. Remember, dead people don't recover. This is where harm reduction comes into play. Syringe service providers don't encourage drug use among known users. What they do is provide clean needles to people who are going to use anyway. Just as importantly, these programs take used needles off the street and also serve as a gateway and connection point to health services and recovery resources when the person decides they are ready to seek help. These locations serve as a first point of contact for getting people off the streets and into recovery. Medication-assisted treatments like methadone or suboxone are not just substituting one drug for another. These are life-saving medications that address the physical dependency of drugs so that the person has the time and space to seek help, rebuild their world, and discover a life worth surviving for. The point of these programs is not to enable or encourage drug use. The point of these programs is to put time on the clock to help keep people alive so that there is more time for them to find their way to recovery. Because remember what we said here, dead people never recover. And so even though these topics are challenging, we are not here to encourage or enable drug use. We are seeking practical solutions to improve our world, protect our communities, and recover our friends and keep our loved ones alive. If you have any more questions about harm reduction, please reach out. All right, so that was that was a project done from the Clinton Foundation that was created specifically for faith-based, uh, really for churches, like churches across the country that don't understand what harm reduction is. Oh, hold on. Heavyweight Miss Driver burst onto the scene with her 1995 film, Circle of Friends. Which would go on the stars later in the Bond film, Gold. We don't want to watch YouTube here. <laughs> Sorry about that. Lots of things to click on. Um, that's what that was created for. And um, yeah, it's been a good just kind of tool to get to the bones. Harm reduction is pretty um, 
controversial. It's con it can be considered radical in um, at least through the lenses of abstinence-based folks and living in a society where we're used to getting people into recovery through punitive measures. Um, and harm reduction doesn't really do that. Uh, yeah, and it you know it's hard to school people on on the framework of found the the framework foundation of what harm reduction is in just a few minutes. But I did feel grateful for both Advantage and um, the Clinton Foundation for for making that. Um, so we're gonna tear through some of this. Then we're gonna have some questions that are specific to harm reduction. Um, we might not go through all these, but I do wanna say all of you will get handouts. You will get the exact content that is on these slides, plus some additional stuff. We'll send you some handouts specifically about um, some of the substances and kind of how to address, how, how to address like serving our people with what's going on right now. Um, yeah, so harm reduction is not the opposite of recovery. People often think that um, in harm reduction, we do believe that there's a spectrum of harms and we support people with any positive change. Um, but it is one pathway of many that is often a more patient and sustainable route for many. We know that a lot of folks don't pick up a white chip or a white key tag and never struggle again, right? It's an approach to treating those with substance use disorders that does not require patients or clients or peers or whatever to commit to complete abstinence before treatment begins. Instead, an array of practical strategies are deployed to reduce the negative health and social consequences of substance use. It aims to change behavior according to the goals of each, we'll say person, whether that means moderation of use or complete abstinence. In harm reduction, complete abstinence is a choice to be made by that person, not a condition imposed by a treatment program. A basic tenet of harm reduction is respect for patients and their capacity to change. And I will say we often support people who, um, who get better a little bit at a time. Like they'll put the needle down and be smoking. They'll put more time in between their substance use. Um, I mean, I could give a whole lot of examples of what it looks like. Let's see. Uh, okay. Specifically, so the SSP part, the, the, the needle exchange, the syringe service program, that's probably the least of well, it, it's the least time that's taken throughout a day, uh, but people go straight to, to that. And honestly, that kind of bothers me because we do so much more than that. But syringe service programs are programs that allow injection drug users to trade in their already used syringes for brand new clean syringes. In doing so, massively decreases infection rates of HIV, hepatitis C, endocarditis, and abscesses. To name a few of which thylazine is creating an incredible amount of, and we'll talk more about that. It also helps keep used syringes off the streets and sidewalks and prevents needle sticks to police and healthcare workers. People who use drugs can also learn about many other services at the same time. This is a fun fact. Drug users who access syringe service programs are five times more likely to reach out for and receive treatment from them, those who don't. That is from the CDC. Also, that's not just that's not just Riley, because he said so. <laughs> okay, people say this all the time. Won't giving drug users clean needles just encourage them to use more drugs? No, it does not encourage them to use more drugs, but it does encourage them to use the drugs they are already using more safely. And while we wholeheartedly support substance use prevention and treatment efforts, we know that the most effective way to prevent the spread of HIV or hepatitis C is to stop it at its source, the needle. By meeting drug users where they're at in the spectrum of their use, we encourage any positive changes that our participants are ready and able to make. We know that our participants care about their lives and their well being. We strive to provide the knowledge, tools, and support they need to make safer and healthier decisions. And again, that any positive changes, we, 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 that's like a saying we use a lot. 
Um, and again, what I just said on the last slide from the CDC, um, it, when we send these to you, we'll have the links embedded in. So from the email, you can go out to different spaces and kind of uh, learn more if you would like. Um, and I will say, I do want to say this, like I'm a person with lived experience, both with IV drug use, um, but like I have an older brother that became HIV positive in the early 90s. I was 12 and swore I would never do anything to put me at risk. And by the time I was 14, I was using drugs intravenously um, and I got hep C that I don't know, I got it as a teen, I had it, at, I, I mean, I'm guessing maybe 25 years, um, but you know what, like, I didn't know that, I didn't know that viruses lived in the cottons and the cookers, right, and I did have access to a needle exchange that was a one for one, but there, there were so many conversations that weren't happening, and which is one of the reasons that we are deeply committed to education um, I mean, if we can avoid anyone going through like what I've went through or uh, e even in my experience, I'm still grateful that I was able to be treated and um, that I'm still alive. I mean, I don't, I don't know how else to say that. Um, these are the principles of harm reduction, y'all. And I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to read all these. I don't know if the way your thing is set up, if you can see me on camera. So this literally, uh, like I have these right beside my desk and I constantly, like when I have to make hard decisions, those are the, these are the lenses that I, that I look through. Um, again, we don't have time to read them all but I really, really encourage you when you get the email, when Al sends you the email that has your CEUs, please click on it. I mean, you're gonna get inundated with information um, on all of this, but y'all, I mean, I know this is gonna sound cheesy, but like, I got so much love for harm reduction. Like, uh, and I took a deep dive into it during the pandemic when we couldn't go to in-person meetings and I started going to harm reduction works meetings and like talking with and connecting with other people who uh, like live by these principles, like it is so much more than a job to me. It is a lifestyle. It is a way of being, it is love. It is acceptance. It is radical acceptance, um, which were things that were innately hard for me. Um, yeah. I got, I got a lot of beautiful things to say about the principles of harm reduction. Um, yeah, how can, hold on one second. Okay, there we go, it's the next one. Okay, how can we, how can peer support and harm reduction align? And uh, to me, knowing so much about both, it seems like a, a silly question, but I know that it's not, especially, you know, my first jobs as a peer, we're in very different spaces, but peer support and harm reduction align on meeting people where they're at and respecting the, the choice of the individual first. But I will acknowledge some of the jobs that we have as peers, we don't get to respect their choice. We, we're, our job, with our job, we pretty much have to force them into a mold and that can be a difficult thing but is working as peers, the conversations that we have with them, how they connect with us, how we talk to them, uh, we get to choose those things. We still have autonomy over how we treat our peers. Um, drug use and behavior are complex, right? Rather than ignoring, condemning, or asserting a just say no approach, it is important to reduce the harmful effects of chronic long-term drug use. When someone is in active chaotic drug use, they often expect that the system surrounding them will shame and punish their use, so much so that they often shame themselves or will lie and lie to themselves even um, in ways that really aren't necessary. 
Uh, and I'm, I'm sure some of y'all have seen that. Um, peers can come from a place of non-bias and without judgment and open up conversation for safer practices. Um, I don't know about y'all, but I have a plethora of lived experience that I can pull from. And often folks will, folks will say certain things and I'm like, oh man, like, you know, I just you don't, and they'll say things and like try to like be like, oh, well this or that. And I'm like, really? Cause when I was shooting dope, I, you know, I'd use that. I'd use those so long there'd be no numbers. The numbers would be off, right? Like, oh, just, it, you know, and just like spit some facts about what chaotic IV drug use is like. And, you know, they'll kind of laugh and then we'll get a, we'll eventually get to the real parts of the conversation which are the important parts. And y'all know, like as peers, uh, we can do that in a way when we tap into our own lived experience. So this next one, a little bit of questions, but let's keep it on harm reduction because uh, we want to hit on the um, fentanyl and xylazine stuff, which we'll do next. So if you want to drop stuff in the chat, I'm going to keep my screen as it is and Al you want to yeah uh so there was one question earlier that asked questions about the experiences of um um Portugal and Seattle with regard to harm harm reduction yeah um well is that all that it says does it say any more there it says do, what do you say to people who point to Seattle when talking about harm reduction okay. I'm guessing you could point to Portugal model as well Am I yes. conflating things? Well, and so I'm from the Pacific Northwest. I was born in Olympia, Washington. I was raised in Aberdeen, Seattle, Portland, which is where I came here from. Um, that's where I did all my using. That's where I had access to services like these. And that's where I got strung out when I was a kid. Um, it is a lot different up there. It's astro it is wildly different. Um, so I, I mean, I have like, I could answer that by means of just factual statistics. Um, but my opinion is like, like people try to say that those are by Portugal models, but they're, they're not like what they did. So it acknowledges that a lot of cre harm is created from drug laws, right? And there is both decriminalization and then legalization. They decriminalized a lot of substance use, which is great, but they haven't really put, put everything in place that Portugal did. Um, and one thing I love, and anyone who's went through the CARES Academy, that whole like the opposite of addiction is connection, right? One thing that Portugal did is they took a whole lot of the money that used to go to hospitals and jails and all that stuff and put it into helping drug users reacclimate into society, right? They would go to, like, say you used to be a mechanic, they would go to a garage and say, okay, if you hire this person who's coming out of active chaotic substance use, if you pay half of their stuff, we'll pay half of their stuff and they're doing drug treatment too. And you have to live in a recovery residence with other people. There's all these stipulations that the systems in Seattle and Portland um, have not implemented. And they keep saying that as time goes by, they'll take the money. And one thing that is cool is with the legalization and decriminalization of cannabis, um, a lot of that money goes into treatment efforts and harm reduction efforts, but it hasn't really caught up yet. Um, uh, Riley, would you say that Seattle and Portland are the leaders in harm reduction in the United States? Um, they're the, um, yes and no, honestly. They're leaders in beginning decriminalization but there are many other places of the country where harm reduction, I mean, New York finally has two safer consumption sites, which we're very familiar with, with alcohol. They're called bars, <laughs> right? <clears throat> um, 
I mean, real talk, like mm -hmm. that's, I mean, we know what a safer consumption site is, but when it's with illicit substances, but I will say there, there's, it, that is one thing that my mind has massively changed on. Cause I thought that like safer injection sites, safer consumption sites, whatever we want to call them. I thought it was too edgy and too radical, but y'all there, there've been 110 worldwide. And you know how many people have overdosed in one of those sites? Zero, zero. So like it is absolutely saving lives. And we learned some of the best stuff around Narcan, Naloxone, best practice and how to deal with overdoses from those sites. There's one called Insight in Vancouver, Canada, BC. Um, and there are two in New York City that opened last year. One is a peer-based model and one is a medical model and they both have had zero overdoses in that time and it's a place where people go in order to connect with other resources riley i'm going to hit one or two high points in the chat uh dudley mentions uh the book uh the chasing the scream by johan hari mm -hmm. um that's about the war on drugs David Waters uh, observes that uh, harm reduction saves lives. I'm not surprised that you love this pathway. Not a question, just a comment. Um, Dudley asks, what about, what would you say to someone about safe use locations is like establishing a drunk driving lane on the interstate? I think you already just uh, ju uh, addressed that by saying it's like bars. Uh, and finally, um, here's one that says, how do we get more self-harm reduction machines in Augusta, Georgia? I want to do all I can uh, to advocate for these and so much more. Yeah, so um, there are vending machines that um, they have different things in them. Um, Narcan, Naloxone, which we'll talk more about, um, test strips, namely fentanyl test strips or the most popular currently um it, all different kinds of supplies um can be got in these vending machines and um these can be purchased through harm reduction funding that's some big conversations that i can get in and honestly like i don't know if i should say this but i'm gonna like okay above the table access point has been serving about I want to say 30 counties. I think we did like 27 or 28 counties last 12 month period, June or July through June. And including the year before that, 30 counties we have folks coming to. We have funding for Athens Clark County and Winder Barrow County. Mm -hmm. um, folks are coming to get our services from all over, but that's above the table. But on the DL, like we've been sending stuff to Augusta. Um, We've got a new project going on in Columbus. Like, I mean, we're wicked busy, but if you if you want to help in Augusta, because like we can ask for money, but we need we need bodies and people willing to do the work and willing to like truly be trained in a harm reduction thing. So whoever whoever may said that question like send an email to access point and we'll further this conversation that uh, was christina morris okay and i uh, am thinking uh do we want to move on riley it's yeah, uh, halfway we do, we do. Uh, so i'll save some of these other questions for later excellent okay so what is fentanyl y'all uh. This one's been hard for me because I feel like we're on the back end of this epidemic. Uh, fentanyl is a powerful synthetic opioid. Opioids are synthetic, meaning man-made, humans made them. Opiates are naturally derived, meaning nature made them and we processed them. So fentanyl is a synthetic opioid, similar to morphine. But can be, and it really, it can be like 40 to 100 times more potent, depending on how cut and other adulterants are added. Um, like heroin, morphine, and other opioids, fentanyl works by binding to the body's opioid receptors, which are found in areas of the brain that control pain and emotion. 
I talk a lot about that with the map meds also about binding, the binding affinity rate of these medications, which is how they help. The high potency of fentanyl greatly increases, increases risk of overdose, especially if a person who uses drugs is unaware that a powder or pill contains it. Fentanyl has a shorter half-life than heroin, and although it is much stronger, the effects last for a shorter duration. Um, naloxone is a medicine that can be given to a person to, reduce, to reverse a fentanyl overdose. Multiple naloxone doses might be necessary because of, uh, that is true, but there's a lot of uh, misunderstandings and misconceptions as far as administration. I'm saying naloxone there. Naloxone is the medication. Narcan is a brand name that is specifically a nasal spray. We often say Narcan, uh, it, it's like, like Kleenex versus dish, tissue paper or Tampax versus tampons or Suboxone. We say Suboxone when it's really buprenorphine or Subutex, right? We just wanna make sure people know that naloxone is the medication. And we're finally getting more companies that are making different brand names of naloxone. Uh, Narcan is just one that we use language for all the time. To be, this is just same stuff continued. It was first developed in the late fifties, introduced in the sixties as an intravenous anesthetic. It is legally manufactured and distributed in the United States. And this is just real talk. If you have ever been under anesthesia or had an epidural, my wife made me put that in there, uh, you have likely had fentanyl in your system, okay? Fentanyl in and of itself is not bad, okay? Um, since the late 1960s, it has been FDA approved. It has been in the hospitals. I guarantee a vast majority of us have had fentanyl in our system. Uh, it is illicit fentanyl, and we are not separating those things when we talk about it, and we're demonizing a actually very useful medication. But fentanyl, similar to other commonly used opioid anal analgesics, man, uh, like morphine, produces effects such as relaxation, euphoria, pain relief, sedation, can do confusion, drowsiness, dizziness, nausea, vomiting, urinary retention, which just means it's hard to pee. You got to push it out real hard. Um, hard for bowel movements also, makes it hard to poop. Uh, pupillary constriction just means your eyes get pinned and respiratory depression. Respiratory depression is where overdoses come from and the lenses you want to look through when narcanning or giving naloxone to people. It's all about respiratory depression. Fentanyl in its most popular form as a legally prescribed medication comes most often as a transdermal patch. Transdermal means absorbed through the skin. Although it is also prescribed and sold as a lollipop and both a sublingual, which means under the tongue, absorbs under the tongue, just like Suboxone, and a nasal spray. Those are different brands that make those. They're really supposed to be for late stage cancer, right? Uh, the company that makes the nasal spray, they got in trouble for fraud on insurance companies trying to prescribe it to all these different people that didn't have late stage cancer. There's been a lot of, a lot of pharmaceutical companies have like followed the Purdue nonsense. I won't get into that, but if you watch Hulu or Netflix, you're probably seeing some of this stuff. Illicit fentanyl is made in, here's the deal. We need to separate this. Illicit, that's the stuff that's on the streets. It's made as a powder form and real talk here in Georgia, it's added as it adulterant, it's a cut into boy or heroin and press pills. Uh, we have not seen, we have no toxicology reports that actually show fentanyl in meth. There have been batches of cocaine, mostly around Atlanta, that have. Um, and again, like we give out fentanyl test strips and we stopped at 
we had to stop at a certain point, especially the math folks, man. They love to play with them. And uh, they, they're more likely to kick false positives than they are false neg negatives. And I was doing a training with our volunteers and um, I was showing them like how not to do it, which really it just isn't enough dilution. And I used over-the-counter aspirin and it was kicking false positives with over-the-counter aspirin. Uh -huh. And I just say that because we often think that those test strips without talking about how to use them is like, we need to have more education. Okay, true or false, y'all, fentanyl is so dangerous that you can overdose simply by touching it because it's absorbed through the skin. Let's get this poll going. Tell me what you think. We're going, we're up to 28 recipient response respondents. Come on, everybody, let's get closer to 100%. For real, all you not paying attention or doing something else. Hello. You. <laughs> Here we go. We're up to 78. Feel loud, those of you sleeping. And it's rolling in right at 50 50. Uh, let me show you. I'm going to end the poll. Uh, right now we are at 50. Uh, 19 people say true. 17% say false. Excellent. Okay. That's, that's what I wanted to see. You have posed a good question, Riley. I have, because this is a narrative that massive amounts of people are confused about, understandably so. Um, and this literally is why I'm trying to, this exact same reasoning is why I'm trying to get ahead of the xylazine stuff because we are so behind on fentanyl and there is so much misunderstandings and miseducation. Even the media is spitting a bunch of stuff. We have this big thing with, if for some reason it's only law enforcement that keeps getting these uh, fentanyl poisonings. It's not nurses at hospitals, it's not EMS. It's not drug dealers, people buying and selling and use, it's just law enforcement. Um, it's very interesting. So we're gonna talk about that. Here's another video, I'll try to move stuff. Sorry on the, I hit mute because I, I coughed earlier and I, I will not hit mute this time. <laughs> so yes, that was a false question. Thank you, Riley. Uh, things like morphine and heroin are opiates that are made from the poppy plant versus fentanyl is a synthetic made in a lab uh, opioid that hits the opioid receptor. It's really potent, it's really strong. Uh, we use it in the hospital all the time. It's a really safe drug when used properly by doctors and nurses, but when it's really concentrated and people are using it at home, they can accidentally overdose very easily. It's a common myth that just by touching fentanyl, you can absorb it, but you really can't. And it's important that we emphasize and clarify that. It's so poorly absorbed through the skin that pharmaceutical companies actually spent millions and millions of dollars to develop something called a fentanyl patch. It's a very special way to deliver fentanyl in a patch that you wear. And even then, it's not very well absorbed. But definitely the powder or pills or anything that you find, not really absorbed through the skin. People who have an opioid toxicity, opioid overdose that uh, ingested some fentanyl or injected fentanyl, they have minutes, maybe just moments to live. So pausing, putting on whole body suit, PPE, or waiting for other people to arrive means that person might die. So we really need to intervene and help them as quickly as possible. Um, that might be by doing CPR. It might mean by giving the antidote, which I carry with myself all the time, Narcan naloxone. So we have just moments to do that. And so waiting because we're concerned about skin exposure is not correct. <laughs> Inhaling fentanyl can technically cause an overdose, but it doesn't get aerosolized very well. So fentanyl has something called a low vapor pressure. So you really can't aerosolize it without some very complex mechanism. You can play with it. You can technically throw it up in the air and have it fall and you really won't breathe significant amounts in. So it's not really dangerous to walk in a building that has fentanyl in it. You don't need a fancy respirator or anything like that. So I told a friend of mine recently, who's a paramedic um, about this because she was really worried about getting exposed to fentanyl. And the relief on her face when I clarified that it's not really something she needs to worry about, that she's not going to walk into a building and touch fentanyl or breathe it in and, and have something bad happen to her, was, it was such a relief. She told her family and they were relieved. So I think it's really important that we make sure everyone understands how this works. 
when someone overdoses on fentanyl or another opioid, their breathing will slow. Uh, they'll eventually become unconscious and their breathing may stop altogether. And that's how it's deadly. If you find someone who's overdosed on fentanyl or another opioid, you should call 911. And if you have Narcan, naloxone, you should administer to them. Um, the two most common ways it's administered are intranasally through the nose um, and then also an injection. Um, and in California, you can get uh, Narcan, naloxone. Anyone can get it without a prescription. Walking into a space, evaluating a, a person who's overdosed on fentanyl, calling 911, even doing CPR and definitely administering Narcan are all 100% safe to do. Okay. Let me see. All right. Y'all got that? We did. Your camera's off, Riley. There it we go. Is. I know. I was blowing my nose and stuff. <laughs> um, I get weird. Like when I do stuff like this, I'm like coughing and sneezing. And like I try really hard to do it not on camera. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> the second video, y'all. Um, I'll talk after it, actually. One more. This is about, uh, some of you will have seen this. This was a very widespread video of an officer in San Diego who um, allegedly overdosed. Um, there's a whole lot of stuff like this happening in the eventual took years release of the entire thing. You can hear him talking to EMS and saying, this is the sixth or seventh time I've passed out. There was never, there has never of all of these reports, they are never backed up with the toxicology report. Either the toxicology isn't done because it's law enforcement, they just trust it. If there is toxicology reports done, the media does not pick it up and share it. Uh, but a lot of people are really confused because it does not make sense. Um, there's also a thing with like uh, fentanyl laced weed, uh, powdered fentanyl burns up at an astronomically lower level. Those of you who have used, you know that if you do smoke fent, there's a barrier. You do not put a flame directly on it. It's literally like It'd be like saying that people smoke powdered cocaine on cannabis, uh, which those of us who have history with using know that that's not an effective way to use. Um, and every single time it's like, oh, my neighbor's daughter's basketball coach's wife's second cousin smoked and got and it it's this it's like so far removed um uh, and let's be real it's a lot of young people that are not going to say like substance use is more stigmatized than anything else like people are gonna say like oh that must have been on my joint not from the pill that i bought off of snapchat right but scientifically it's just it's not backed up. Some say what the video shows isn't realistic. News Ace David Gossipson spent the day working to get answers for us. David? Science is very clear that you cannot overdose by touching fentanyl. The notion that a deputy could overdose by simply touching or accidentally breathing fentanyl is false. According to Health Sciences Associate Professor Leo Beletsky at UC San Diego School of Medicine. It is technically impossible to touch fentanyl powder and feel any effects of it, let alone overdose. Last week, Sheriff Bill Gore posted what he called a public safety video showing body cam footage of a deputy collapsing on the pavement, claiming he had been exposed to fentanyl in the field. I'm Deputy David Feiley, and I almost died of fentanyl overdose. It's unclear exactly how the deputy was exposed whether by touch or accidental inhalation. But some experts say the video may contribute to a false narrative about fentanyl overdose. This video is, is not an overdose. It is not possible to overdose on fentanyl in this way. Ryan Marino is a medical toxicologist at Case Western Reserve University in Ohio. His pupils are normal size. 
Um, his color never changes. His arms are kind of rigid and outstretched. His eyes stay open. All of these things really point away from an opioid overdose or, or any overdose. The UC San Diego doctor agrees. The visible symptoms, what we see from the video, could be consistent with a panic attack. Um, it could be, you know, any number of things. People have, you know, fainting uh, events all the time. And Dr. Marino says the sheriff's video actually does a disservice to first responders. If I told you day in and day out that if you are near fentanyl, if you touch fentanyl by accident, you're going to overdose, you're going to die. Then the second you come into contact with something that you think is fentanyl or you confirm is fentanyl, that is going to cause a very severe fear, panic reaction. The doctors who appeared in our report were first interviewed by the New York Times, so this case is getting national attention. News 8 asked the Sheriff's Department to release all of the body cam video that appeared in this incident uh, to News 8, and they tell us that will happen as soon as possible. Marcella? David, there's no question that fentanyl represents a real public safety risk. How is that deputy doing? We wanted to interview that deputy, but the sheriff's department says he is out of the country and unavailable. News 8 also requested the sheriff's department release toxicology reports that would prove he actually overdosed on fentanyl. We are still waiting for a response to that request. Definitely uh, an eye-opening and somewhat alarming video, uh, but it is raising questions about fentanyl and the dangers of it. Thanks so much, David. Some say what the video shows. Okay. So let's see. So to this day, there has never been a toxicology report from that incident. There's all kinds of other things that show that this officer has a history of fainting. Literally, as it's shown in the video, he's looking at a substance about to do like an in-field test. And the other officer walks up and says, dude, you got to be careful with that. And he falls down. Um, there's a multitude of these. There was one that happened in Indiana recently. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I don't mean to laugh, but um, there was, I, I want to say it was like 21, 22 correctional officers who had found a powder, white powdered unknown substance in like hidden in a ventilation system in a prison. And like, it was 21, 22 of them that needed medical care. Um, a lot of them were narcan on site. Two of them went to the hospital. After the toxicology report was done, the unknown white substance was shown to be um, baby powder and acetaminophen. Uh, something is happening with an epic like fear-based narrative. Um, this is harmful to the people that we serve because people are not wanting to do rescue breathing. They're not wanting to touch people of suspected overdoses. The narrative, people are saying that they found a dollar bill on the street and touched it. Um, the only form of fentanyl that is transdermal meaning that it can be absorbed through the skin is the fentanyl patches. And that doctor in the first video said that they have spent millions of dollars in order to learn how to make it transdermal. Earlier in this presentation, I kept talking about how important it is to differentiate legal medical grade fentanyl versus illicit fentanyl. They are not the same. They are not the same. Okay, so now we're gonna dive in to xylazine, okay? I wanna get through this. Um, here's another poll, okay? What is your current knowledge of xylazine? You'll see it. What the heck is xylazine? Some of you might've heard of trank dope, trank, trank dope, zombie drug, but don't know much about the details. I know about xylazine, but everything I've heard, I know from the media, TV, Facebook, that kind of stuff. Or you know about xylazine and you learned about it from a professional, right? All right, every the answers are coming in. We've heard from 33 of the 43 participants so far. 
Keep it coming, y'all. Keep it coming, y'all. Mm -hmm. I, I appreciate the discussion of fentanyl contact panic. I think it might need to actually enter the dictionary that way. That's crazy. It's the, I, I seriously, like, because my brother came up pause so young and I was alive in the 80s and remember, like, it literally reminds me of the hysteria around HIV AIDS. I mean, yeah. I remember being at a Christmas party and my dad telling me not to drink off anyone's soda because someone there had AIDS and people, you know, like bathroom stalls. And I mean, just a lot of the nonsense yeah. narratives and we are doing it right now with these substances. So can y'all see the poll results? 16% uh, is 40, 41%, 16 of you have heard of Frank or zombie drug. Uh, 11 of you, know about xylazine, but you've heard about it through the news. Five of you have heard about it from professionals and seven of you say, what the heck is xylazine? Yep. So there Excellent. we go. Thank okay. you, let me stop sharing. Yep, that helps. This always re-pops up, okay. Okay, what is it, okay? Xylazine is a veterinary animal tranquilizer, specifically for large animals. It is a non-opioid used as a sedative, anesthetic, muscle relaxant, and analgesic, and is used as a takedown agent for large animals. It's most popular in horses, okay? It was first synthesized in 1962 by Bayer Pharmaceutics, and although it was researched for use in humans, trials were terminated due to I its- really want. Just text me what you, oh, you can't. Okay. Some, someone's yeah. unmuted. Yeah. Oh, you gotta mute yourself. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'll find it. Hang on just a second. All right, Riley, are you there? Can you unmute yourself? Unmute yourself, Riley. I never did mute myself. I uh, think someone did that when I couldn't get up quickly enough to stop the person who was unmuted. So I apologize for that. No worries. No worries. We can roll with it. Um, it's never been approved by the FDA is the point for use in humans, which makes it really difficult because we are literally in real time learning its effects in human consumption. Xylazine has increasingly been found in the illicit opioid drug supply frequently mixed with fentanyl. Okay. In Georgia, we are currently only seeing it in the illicit opioid supply, specifically substances sold as boy heroin, right, and fentanyl. However, mass spectrometer testing is showing that there is no heroin present, only fentanyl and xylazine, in addition to other non-narcotic additives, which is just different language for fillers or cut, as we say. Uh, I want to hit on that real quick because I don't want people to freak out and think that xylazine's in the meth. The only thing that we have found it in in Georgia is in boy, but and I, I will tell you, we have people that still think they're using heroin. That heroin in the last few years has turned into fentanyl, and the fentanyl is now being cut with xylazine, and um, they still think that there's heroin in it. Uh, people who use drugs often refer to it as trank or trank dope, those who are aware of it. Um, and sometimes the zombie drug. I hear a lot of that here in Georgia. We have yet to see xylazine sold by itself only as an additive. The only place that I know where it's been sold by itself is in Philadelphia, uh, Kensington. It's having a huge thing. You could go down a huge rabbit hole of, um, xylazine use in Philadelphia. I will say though, it is much like fentanyl. If you wanna research this on your own, be really careful as to what it is that you're paying attention to. Um, like actual harm reductionists, um, the National Harm Reduction Coalition, great place to get information actual doctors, medical professionals, toxicologists, um, but the regular news loves to pick up on um, the hysteria. I mean, I don't know how else to say that. 
Riley, uh, do you want a few quick questions here? Let we are almost done. Okay, it's done. Um, xylazine is a central nervous system depressant. These are effects. Okay, I'm just going to go right into effects. Loss of physical sensation, feeling disconnected from one's body, a loss of balance, equilibrium, loss of consciousness. It's like you black out. Even if the person appears somewhat conscious, they may be unaware of what is happening, what's going on around them. They won't remember. It's an intense intoxication, increased effects from other drugs, which can complicate overdose presentation and treatment. That's because it's usually cut into other things. Cotton mouth, huge thing. Confusion, disorientation, lack of awareness of one's surrounding. Abscesses, it's a huge abscess thing. A lot of them turn black, they take longer to heal, can grow into infections. Um, I'm back in, I wanna say March, that's how we started. Like I was seeing black dots on people and was like, what is going on? We start, our nurse started testing. Um, we, did a, we did 12 tests, some of which I sent out out of state for mass spectrometer testings. 11 of the 12 samples that we tested all had xylazine in them. And I will say, and this pisses me off to no end, the only information that we have testing on xylazine in the state of Georgia is from coroners, which means that people have already freaking died, which is this information right here, okay? Um, I won't go through the whole thing, but y'all, from 20 to 22, it increased over a thousand, over 11, 1120%. Um, you can see the, increase on the visual map right there. And again, this was put out by DPH from the coroners who are doing testing for xylazine. I'm advocating like a mofo to try to get testing, to try to test the supply prior to people's death. And to me, this just really shows the total and complete disdain, lack of respect and dignity for people who use drugs. Okay, which let's be real, that's all of us X amount of time ago, or maybe currently, right? Ooh, how can we best support folks? Use facts when educating, stay away from shame-based language. Don't say this good, bad, right, wrong thing. Educate them to be aware of overdose risks, no matter the substance. Encourage them to practice as much harm reduction as possible, as consistently as possible. Educate them about fentanyl and xylazine in the drug supply. And again, currently only found in the illicit opioid supply in Georgia. Ask about any atypical wounds or abscesses. You educating them may be the first time they are hearing about xylazine. I cannot emphasize that enough. And I say that because that's what's happening with us. When using harm reduction messaging, share facts about xylazine and the effects therein, but stay away from using any messaging that includes fear-based or shame-based language. We already know that scaring or shaming someone out of chaotic substance use often perpetuates more shame, encourages people to hide their behaviors, that lying I was talking about earlier, and not seek help, and is much less likely to empower the user toward healthier, towards making healthier choices and behaviors meeting them where they are and supporting them without judgment is the priority, okay? I cannot emphasize this enough. These are things that we say to them, start low, go slow, okay? You can always use more, but you can't take away too much. Mm -hmm. Test your product if you can. Turn them on to harm reduction agencies like ourselves. I wish I had more referrals there, but I don't. Um, sniffing or smoking is often safer than injecting. Avoid using alone because of the head, heavy sedation. Be aware of your surroundings and possessions, especially if you're somewhere that's not safe or secure. Be aware of your belongings. And I'm just going to say really bad things can happen to people, um, not even in an overdose, just when they're in that blackout phase. And they'll wake up, their shit's gone, something bad happened to them. You know what I'm saying? Um, Carry naloxone, Narcan, know how to use it. Look out for each other. Make sure it's visible and easily accessible, okay? Get it out, have it out while 
they're using, you're using, whatever. Call 911 if necessary and tell them there is an unresponsive person. I'm not going to lie. I don't think that the police showing up all the time always helps. People need medical interventions. People are scared to call 911 because of punitive measures. People get their kids taken away. People go to jail. We could talk about the Good Samaritan law, but I'm on the front lines and I see people all the time that are scared and that stuff's not always happening. Um, be sure the person's airway is open, is breathing might be blocked in some positions. And I'm saying that because they'll be folded into a weird position. Um, it's not necessarily that anything's in their airway. Just try to get them flat, especially with Narcan, uh, nasal Narcan. Y'all, they're not breathing. And like, yeah, nasal seems really easy, but if, they're, if they fell out in a car, sitting on a couch, and you hit them with nasal, they're not breathing, y'all. It's just going to roll right back out, right? They got to be flat with their neck up and make sure that gravity is actually helping to go down which is where the IMs, the intramuscular, you can go through clothes. You just wanna hit the upper arm, the butt, the thigh, um, get it in there. Okay, we got Q&A and I'm just gonna say real quick, I got a bunch of resources for y'all, okay? Um, never use a loan hotline, we give those cards out too. People literally can call a 1-800 number and have a operator sit on the phone with them while they fix and if they become unresponsive they will get ems and not the police there please when al sends this to you click on it and i know a lot of y'all are probably just going to be like where are my ceus but i intentionally put some really good info in here and y'all like this is saving our people this could be your best friend or the godparents of your kids in a few years that will freaking die, right? Um, just please, please check out the info we give you, okay? Riley, your combination of passion and information is great. Thank you so much. Well, great. It doesn't feel good to be me though, because I freaking cry and get mad all the time, but... I, 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 was... <laughs> I will hit the comments. Uh, Tara, were you going to say something? Excuse me. No, I was thinking the same thing you was thinking. Yeah. The passion and information is flowing. <laughs> so I'll hit the comments on xylazine first, Riley, if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Amanda McConnell says they are getting numerous cases of xylazine at the great EED. It's frightening. Mm. Andrew Hill asks if we can test for it. And is it a hypnotic drug? Um, it's a tranquilizer for animals, if that gives you a frame of reference. It is meant to knock out large physical things, okay? Which, of course, it does with us. I have not hit on this yet, and I want to do it before I forget. There is a narrative that people should not... We have folks come to us that have heard about it, and they're like, I don't need no Narcan. That doesn't work on this trank dope, right? This is cut into fentanyl. Like, yeah, it doesn't work on the xylazine, but it sure is works on the fentanyl and that you do not want to tell people that you do not want to tell people not to use narcan that narcan doesn't work on it this is happening in addition as an additive to fent fent 100 percent reacts and responds to naloxone y'all and this is one of these things that like where messaging is so important People will say stuff like that, though, thinking that they're scaring people into not using. That does not work. And y'all, I don't know about you, but any of y'all that have shot dope, I have never, ever not used because I didn't have access to a clean rig. Right? I worked it out. I worked it out and I used anyway. Right? And like, that's that thing of acceptance where like we just accept that people are where they are. We do not use messaging that's uh, good, bad, right, wrong, anything implying shame, just facts. And still keep pushing the Narcan naloxone. Um, I don't even know if that answered your question, Al. Did that answer Andrew's question? 
I think, and is it uh, test? We can test for it. Testing. That's right. I didn't hit on testing. I knew there was something there. I'm trying really, really, really hard for us to be able to get a mass spectrometer where we can do testing the same way that the people who sends it out. It infuriates me again that the only testing is happening after people who use drugs are dead. I mean, that just, to me, that's like such a beautiful example. It is literally why we are here. Like, and I literally feel that as harm reductionists, we are the only people trying to take care of active users, right? Like we tell them to go away. We tell them to come back when they're ready. We tell them to come back once they've hit bottom. And y'all, we are in a different day and age. People are dying before that bottom comes up to them. Like we have to be supporting people in a different way. Like this is not the heroin that I started shooting in the mid nineties, right? Like, and we need to be talking about it different. We need to be reacting and responding differently. And yes, testing needs to happen. Um, you, gotta, you gotta send stuff out of state if it's mass spectrometers, but otherwise, and again, we have, man, I should have, I have some over there. Uh, we have fentanyl test strips, benzo test strips, and xylazine test strips. Um, but again, though, we won't give them out unless we can really educate folks, because um, it too can start this like mass hysteria thing, um, and it has to be massively diluted. They were in, in initially created for urine drug samples, and when you think about testing urine, you know that's very diluted. They will often use too much of a substance and not enough water. We tell people we have these little blue waters um, and just make sure people doing it correctly. Andrew, I hope that answered your question. What's well, next? I'm, I'm gonna go back and pick up a question George put in the chat a while back. It says, do you expect harm reduction to include cannabis reduction, not abstinence and or psychedelic treatment in the near future? Um, yes. Um, mm, that's like, I could answer that question from like what's happening culturally and socially, and then answer it from like what I think, um, we absolutely like there's maps there, there's like psychedelic substances that are being integrated into a lot of trauma therapy, um, which is proving to be effective, um, cannabis use. I mean, I think sometimes that as folks, okay, it's my opinion that abstinence-based recovery communities sometimes can get so set in our ways that we're unwilling to see progress or lives saved if people don't reach this bar that has collectively been set for them, right? Um, and that happens, that infuriates me. Like we'll send folks to the clinic and I know they are shooting dope six, eight times a day and it's nine months later and maybe they're just smoking weed or maybe they still do dope, but only twice a week, but it's in their screen and then they'll get booted from the place that they're in. Um, or we still have in policy where a lot of recovery residences and this is to no particular thing. It's just the thing across the way where like, okay, you're struggling and you have to go for a week and then come back. And we literally, we try to punish them into abstinence-based recovery when at the same time, out of the other side of our mouth, we're saying that the opposite of addiction is connection, but we have yet to create policy to where we pull the people in rather than push them out until their behavior aligns with what we want. And then, you know, there's the issue of protecting the space itself, but I will say I do copious amounts of work in policy, I won't get into all that. Um, it's the way in which we look at it, the way in which we're supporting folks and having that be different than what we believe is right, right? I hope that helped answer your question, George. And I will just summarize that and say that I wanna keep people alive and I want people to figure out what's best for themselves. And um, I don't push my pathway onto other people. And um, I'm not God. I don't know how else to say that. I'm not going to say what is right or wrong for other people. Um, 
I have taillights that I was able to follow. I know that I'm taillights for some other folks, uh, but it's not my job to judge what pathways are right or wrong. Um, I like to see people stay alive and be their best selves. And CARES taught me that, right? The SAMHSA definition. Yeah. Like it's all about, yeah, I'll stop there. Thank you for that question, George. And I hope that answered it. Uh, so Riley, Brittany Coleman asks about harm reduction meetings. Yeah, so harm reduction works. HRW, uh, they're online. It's a lot different though. I'm not joking. Um, I will say though, the first handful of times I went, I cried because the things that were said and like they have their preambles and the things that are read and, and they say like, we're not here to tell you anything about your use. Active users are welcome here. Abstinence people, based people are welcome here. Everyone in between is welcome here. Um, man, and like, it is wildly different. If you're used to 12 step meetings and you hit that, it like prepare to be shocked. Um, but personally, I absolutely loved it because I felt like the support of um, uh, like the the dignity that I think is lacking in recovery spaces sometimes. And I just know for myself when I would have like slips or setbacks, and I couldn't say slip or setback, it was a relapse, my time was changed, all these things that for me, I really believe perpetuated shame. And sometimes do, I mean, I changed my date when I like took a bong rip and I literally took the bong rip because I was trying to not shoot dope. And I know that if I take a bong rip, I get too scared to shoot dope, right? And I mean, this is all like past things, but that, and then I'd be like, well, man, if I got to change my date, I these whole narratives that like, those things don't matter, right? And like, as a peer and as someone in recovery, when I have someone in front of me, whatever they tell me they want, I will support them, period. I wanna see them stay alive. I don't wanna go to their funeral next week. And if they, if they improve this much, but not this much, I'm still gonna love on them. I'm gonna clap and give snaps all the way to wherever it leads, right? And that's a very different thing. And harm reduction works like you get claps and snaps. And at first, my brain, I was like, why are people supporting this guy? He just smoked crack. Literally, I would think stuff like that. But that was a few years ago. And I look back at like my own thinking. And now, like, I would be front and center supporting that guy who just smoked crack. But because I knew him six months ago, like, I'm not going to tell him he's not good enough. Yeah. Riley, I think it's great when people were quoting your t-shirt back to you in the chat. <laughs> that's, that's you doing your work really well. That's great. It is. And I will say, like, I know this narrative is different. And I want to be really clear that, like, I'm not trying to change any narratives. I'm just trying to add a conversation to conversations that are already there. All right? Like, I'm not saying harm reduction is better than any other pathway. I'm not saying like, like, I just want more of us to be able to support people in different ways. And I want this conversation to be able to be included in recovery spaces. And I, I want more of us to be able to learn how to support people when it's really hard and they're not doing what we think is right, that we still can hold space for them. Riley, do you want to put some contact information in the chat? And of course, uh, people will have your contact information. I'll make sure it gets included in the email with the certificate as well. Yes, all of it will. And literally, if you just Google Access Point Georgia, Access Point of Georgia, access point harm reduction. Uh, there are a couple other access points in other parts of the country. Just put in Georgia or Athens, you'll get our contact info. My staff should be on here. Um, I cannot see them. Who are you looking for, Riley? I'm looking for... What's up, buddy? Where, where are you? I hear you. That's kind of creepy. 
I there you go. Okay, yeah. there's Joyce and Allison. Is Lottie with y'all? Lottie's right over here on the couch. Hey, yeah, there's my people. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna tell folks to hit the admin, admin at accesspointga.org. Um, again, though, you will get all this stuff. There's stuff on our website. We're about to have more. We will send you handouts of thanks, thanks, you guys. Um, we will send handouts of um, informational things on xylazine that y'all can take to the places that you work that I'm not expecting in this short amount of time that y'all are going to get schooled in ways that are truly necessary. Um, you will get those, print them out. If you're local to here, like come to us, we'll give you copies. Um, but we got to try to save our people. Thank you, Riley. It is 101. So I am going to wrap up by reminding you all to keep an eye out next week for your certificate, mm -hmm. for your CEUs. Mm -hmm. You want to hang on to that and make sure you have it ready to submit in December when we put the link out so that you can upload your CEUs. You'll get one and a half CEUs for this. If you can't find it, search your email on a week from tomorrow with my name, Alvin. Uh, if you're on Gmail, sometimes it will go into your uh, promotions folder rather than into your regular inbox. Uh, and Riley, awesome. This is always, it's always a treat to, to listen to you and to, yeah, thank you. Alvin, will we have a copy of the presentation? Yeah. It'll go out with the certificates next week. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Riley. Thank you, Riley. You always Thanks, give Riley. great information. Thanks, y'all. I appreciate it. it. Thanks, Riley. Thanks, Haley. Wow. Thanks, to... Riley. Th thank you so much, Riley. Thank you, Riley. It was a great presentation. Oh. Good job, guys. Take Thanks. care, bro. All right, guys, I'm going to go ahead and end it. Yeah, thank okay, you. Well, thank you. We'll talk later. All right. Thank Bye. you, Riley. Everybody have a great day. Thanks for showing up. Bye.